it's time to begin our next and final session, uh, debate session of today. It's been a very busy day. So this one is about agroforestry funding and the private sector. And I think, you know, issues about the involvement of the private sector were also um, raised during previous sessions. So I am going to ask you to please quieten down. I always feel like a school teacher when I say these things. But please, can you quieten down? Because we're just about to start. So we're going to run this in exactly the same way as we have done the previous two sessions. I'm going to hand over to a chair, and the chair will introduce his panelists. And then intermittently, we're going to take more of your questions and comments during the Q&A sessions. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our chair for this session, who is Eric Hoffner. Now, Eric is an environmental journalist and has been so for the last 20 years or so. He's also a very talented photographer, mostly of environmental topics. And indeed, he has an exhibition showing in Boston at the moment. Um, he's the editor of Manga Bay, which is an environmental service and he is the editor of its agroforestry series. Eric himself is based in Massachusetts, but the agency itself has got four bureaus. An interesting little tidbit of information about Eric is he himself has seven acres of land, which is mostly forested. He does grow shiitake mushrooms as well, I'm told. So there you go. So very familiar with this mm. theme. So I'm going to hand over to your very capable hands, Eric, and I'll be hearing from you every now and again during the session. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for coming to this session. And uh, really great to see your faces. We look forward to your questions and your, your, your thoughts as, as we try to develop a conversation around how to fund this thing that we're here to discuss. As Karen was saying, I am the editor of our agroforestry series at mangabay.com. I've been sending writers from various regions to uh, visit agroforestry projects in their countries or in the neighboring countries, and they have been learning some really interesting things and reporting it out through our network to our 30 million readers, and we've had fantastic um, feedback from the readers about this, not necessarily realizing that agroforestry is, is, a, is a something that is great for the climate, is something that feeds people, it's something that uh, houses and feeds biodiversity. All these, these things that we have big global challenges going right now on, though, like those three in particular, but also drought and, and um, uh, food security. Um, can be mitigated and solved to some degree through agroforestry. And uh, so they've been going out all over these places and making uh, basically case studies of, of fantastic different uh, projects that are um, cooperatives or indigenous groups or uh, young entrepreneurs. And so these case studies are fascinating. and where we're at now after about 25 of these is, is the point where I'm, I'm ready to say the case is closed. The case is closed that this is a solution that we can all get behind. And it's, it's something that needs to be scaled globally. And it can be scaled globally. And one of our biggest challenges is, is how to fund this movement because you know, this room is full of scientists and practitioners and trainers, people who are skilled at helping communities or learning from communities and then spreading this knowledge. But we need to find ways to support what we do uh, as a community. And as we know, NGO commitments, um, funding for agencies, all these things shift and they, um, will, uh, over time, fail, or however you want to say it, but at the same time, we're watching things like carbon capture technologies, in getting billions of dollars for research 
to turn carbon dioxide into rocks or into fuel. Um, there are a lot of different competing ideas out there, but um, it's all on the bench, as they say. It's all just research still. And at the same time, we have this, this entire sector that's so inspiring and feeds people and, and does all the things that we want as well. And it's, it doesn't get the same level of funding. So I wrote in the Washington Post recently about this just to say, look, all this money that's going from Wall Street into carbon sequestration technology, great, we need that. But we also need agroforestry. And can we get some of that money from Wall Street, from the private sector, into this next thing as well, because it's a solution that's already here. We already know how to do it. It's, it's scalable, you know, it's, it's cheap, um, and it's effective. Uh, and also, another word, empowering. So I made that case in the Washington Post, and, um, and I, I really, you know, it, it got some great feedback. Um, and it told me that this is a, a thing that we really need to explore more. Um, so what can the private sector do as a partner for agroforestry and how, you know, how, what does it look like? So we have a great panel assembled for you to hear from folks who are on the front lines of this, who are piloting things, who are doing things. So what I want to do is um, just introduce them very br briefly and they will each uh, speak and um, they will tell you their bio in a little more detail about the things because they're, they're the real experts on, on themselves. But um, we're going to lead off with Hervé Borguignan over here. Um, he's with the Moringa Fund doing fantastic things in Africa and he's going to speak uh, and in some detail about the Moringa Fund and how it is working and what the, uh, the goals and plans are. And then we're going to hear from his colleagues on my left and right here, including Tony Simons of World Agroforestry, Rachel Colby Samoon with InVivo Foundation, and Jean Manuel Bluet of Nestle, and also Tristan Lecomte of Pour Projet. And um, in between, their sharing, we're going to hear questions from you as well. So as someone is, is, is talking, do jot a note or two and, um, and send us your questions so we can have a conversation as this goes along. But then at the end of the session, we'll have probably 30 minutes of, of Q&A as well. So what I want to do now is give it back over to Karen. Oh, no, it's, it's OK. Um, we I'll introduce Hervé then. You've already introduced Hervé okay. Bourguignon. So Hervé, you're going to deliver a presentation. Thank you very much. So thank you to you all. Uh, I'm working for the Moringa Fund. Uh, the Moringa Fund is an agroforestry fund. That means that we try to promote agroforestry projects. We invest in companies that want to develop in agroforestry projects. This fund has been promoted by the Rothschild family, but has been funded by DFIs, like uh, Proparco in France, like the, the African uh, 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 Development Bank, uh, other DFIs and family office. And we run now uh, uh, about, we have invested in uh, 45 million euro of project, in 10 projects in Latin America and in Africa. Generally, our scheme remains always the same. We, our supply comes from our growers. We have also a small demonstration plot to show what are the best techniques, and we also build uh, processing facilities so that we have a better access to the, to the market. We try to get certification, mainly organic, but also uh, uh, other kind of uh, organic to try to get the premium on the market. And we work for the international market and, and also for the, the local markets. What kind of products do we, do we sell? Um, organic cashew nuts, uh, pineapple, 
pineapple juice, mango, mango juice, dry mango, uh, all kind of different products uh, that, are, that come from our uh, uh, projects. Uh, also, heart of palm. We have also uh, coconut, coconut water, all that, all that kind of product that are produced in an agroforestry way. We use blended finance. We work generally in equity. That is to say that we, we take a share of the companies that we invest in, but we also finance directly or indirectly uh, the, the working capital. We have also an ATAF, a technical assistance facility, which is a, a small fund with appropriated funds to give support to the social aspects and in environmental aspects of our project. And that is financed more particularly by FEFEM. So why agroforestry? We have generally, we oppose two models that are very different conventional agriculture, which is very often monoculture, with fertilization, with pesticides, with genetic selection, a high degree of mechanization, uh, generally integrated into international supply chains because the product that they produce is a commodity. What is a commodity? A commodity is a product that is differentiated by its price and not by its characteristic. So it may the, the, the commodity may come from many different parts of the world. There is no specific traceability. It is quoted on international markets. Uh, and the, the generally, the farmers, the big farmers, get a protection against uh, volatility of price through derivatives, future uh, markets. In that model, scale is very important. The, the higher the scale, the larger the scale, and, uh, and the better. You have now uh, the finance is generally uh, uh, assured by specialized bank. And uh, I think it's important to underline that for uh, this kind of banks, uh, you have all the different parameters of the, agro of, of, the, of, of the farm, of the agriculture, that are very much controlled. The yields are controlled, the price are controlled. You can take insurance also uh, against climate events. Uh, you have uh, uh, the, uh, the outlets are also when well known and well defined. The markets are there. So it's a, it's a, let's say that's a type of agriculture that is rather easy to, to finance. More and more now, the private equity investments are investing in that kind of project because agriculture is becoming an asset class. Now, the criticisms of that model, you have no traceability, uh, a lot of critics about the food that is made out of, that comes out of, this, of the industrial, of the processing of these commodities, the land grabbing, low social and environmental impact, and, and so forth. Agroforestry is far from that. You can see here on the picture, you have a very neat model, the conventional, and you have also the, uh, the agroforestry, which is a little bit messy, let's say. Little inputs no or less mechanization, but you need labor force. And that's why the large families in Africa are often everybody's work on, on, on the agroforestry systems. Very often you have short supply chains, you work on local markets. Uh, the cash is important, but not that important as it is in the conventional where you use there, there's a lot of indebtedness in the conventional system, not in agroforestry. Of course, you have the contractual farming. When the farmers are integrated in an international uh, supply chain, uh, uh, where you can, the, the, the small farmers in Africa can have input in advance and, and have it deducted from the crop, uh, uh, you have that kind of financing. But financing is not a key in, agro, in agroforestry. You have no ready-made industrial solution and no, uh, no, uh, nothing like that. So now the problem is, for us, what to do with agroforestry. Because agroforestry, of course, if we want that the benefits of agroforestry are replicable and scale up, you do need finance. What is the Moringa model? The Moringa model is first to try to identify the growth sectors 
in the, in the, in the, on the markets. The dietary transition in Europe, in the United States, the booming of the organic, uh, the booming of these health trends are important, and also the local market growth in Africa, the local agri-markets are, are, are absolutely exploding. So we have first the market secured. Then we have to identify the supply. Generally, uh, the supply comes from so small outdoor. We work exclusively with inclusive outdoor schemes, and we try to give them as much support as we can. And for that, the demonstration plot is very important to show what are the best techniques uh, the, in permaculture, agroforestry, biodynamics, organic, all these things have to be demonstrated. I mean, a farmer is not going to change his way of doing if he is not convinced that it works. Then the processing plants. Once you have organized the supply, that you have the markets identified, you have to climb the value chain and to get out of the volatility zone uh, that uh, you always face when you work in agriculture. So you, we try to go as far as possible in the processing and to be, uh, uh, let's say, uh, away from this volatility. So we have, for example, uh, uh, invested in uh, high pressure processing uh, in, in, uh, in uh, uh, Belize, that is to say it's not pasteurization, it's just pressure. So you keep the freshness and the, the, all the attributes of the product. We have invested in the roasting and salting equipment for uh, cashew nuts in, uh, in, uh, in Benin. So we are the, the first plant to roast directly in Benin. That's what we try to do to get better access to the markets. And then we sell high value product with certification on international and local markets. So that's generally our model. Let's take a few examples of what we did. Tolaro, we have uh, found two entrepreneurs, an American one and, and a guy from, uh, from, from Benin, that had developed a very interesting outgoing scheme uh, model uh, with, based on the cashew. They were buying the raw cashew nuts and processing, unchaining in, uh, in a small plant. But the plant was uh, not very much mechanized. There was a lot of uh, labor work. And uh, also, they were very limited with the cash loans, and they could not increase their capacity. At that time, when we invested in Tolaro, they were doing 2,000 tons, no more. We have invested um, 8 million in all. So now they have a fully make mechanized company. They can process till 10,000 tons of uh, raw cashew nuts. Uh, they have increased considerably the support that they could give to the smallholders. Uh, we had a mission uh, uh, fortnight ago of an agronomist going to, to see the farmers, and they all said that the, the cash loans, the cash crops, the, the, the cash loans that they received every year has absolutely changed their, uh, their life. And they asked us, why don't you buy more crops from us? For example, soybean. We do produce soybean. And why don't you buy it and, and export it? That will give us more revenue. You have the shibata also in the region. You have also mangoes. And that creates the agroforestry structure of our project in which we try to push all the different categories of revenues of our uh, farmers. Floresta Viva in Brazil, this partner had identified a very nice plantation in the south of Sao Paulo, in the Mata Atlantica, near Guarani, the Guarani uh, community, and he wanted to grow pupunia. Pupunia gives heart of palm. You, there are several ways to do heart of palm, acai, but if you uh, get it from acai, you kill the tree, or from pupunia, and the pupunia uh, um, has cop copies, uh, re re uh, regrowth. So, and we have developed an extraordinary agroforestry system with more than 15 different crops, 15. Uh, the combining the leguminous with also the banana, 
with the Mombasa, with all different types of, uh, of crops. And now we have a system in which the dominance would be the heart of Pal, but we are also a producer of banana and of a lot of different crops. And uh, now that this demonstration plot exists, uh, we can extend it to uh, uh, outgrower around uh, and so that they can get the premium from the organic certification and also the, the, all the different revenues from, from, from that. Another example, Nica France in Nicaragua. In Nicaragua, we, have, we purchased in 2014 an agroforestry plantation of 700 hectares, the largest probably in Latin America, producing coffee under the shade of trees, different uh, species of trees, uh, endemic species, but also commercial species, more than 15 different species, and we've developed that. What we wanted was to extend the system to uh, outgrowers around. So we have identified uh, uh, farmers that had been hit by the, the rust disease or not managing very well their, uh, their plantation or even the plantation had been turned into, uh, into uh, uh, pastry, pastry uh, um, uh, cattle. Uh, and we have developed in each of these uh, different uh, uh, plantation, an agroforestry system in order to build a big cluster. Now with all these firms around that have been developed, we produce around 5,000 tons of, of coffee, high-grade coffee, and uh, we, can, uh, we, can, uh, we have been elected by uh, Nestlé uh, to produce a capsule Nicaragua. It's made with our coffee. The conclusion, the conclusion would be that certainly to upscale the, uh, the uh, agroforestry, you require both. Certainly equity to push the company uh, and to develop agroforestry system and also crop loans. A lot of crop loans uh, for the, uh, the, the day-to-day -day financing of the farmers. But now there is an opportunity for Africa. It's the leapfrog through the organic market. The organic market is developing everywhere in US and in also in Europe. And there is not enough, the, the, the demand uh, exceeds by far the offer. And there is certainly an opportunity for Africa. The, the Moringa, the impact of Moringa is really sizable because we are present in rural region and the money we give uh, between five and ten million dollars per year per project uh, really makes the difference. Uh, now we have points of attention where we focus too much on one commodity. The problem is to have concentration of land, despite we wouldn't like it, but it occurs, and also the fact that the farmers dedicate to the cash crops and not the staple crops. And we have to be very careful of that. That's why the agroforestry has to be there. We have to monitor what sort of crops they are developing and pushing them to go to the staple crops. Uh, the ATA financing, I think uh, this small fund that, uh, that is being financed from various donors like FEFEM and others and uh, the, the, the BAD, the African Development Bank, uh, allows precisely this crop diversification and to increase the positive social impact. Now, Moringa, the fund, is uh, terminated this investment period uh, and we are trying to launch a company now that is going to uh, try to implement regenerative agriculture w on all our projects in uh, agroforestry, using agroforestry, giving more support to our outgrowers uh, uh, scheme, uh, increasing the local processing, and uh, address the dietary, uh, dietary transition on the international market and, of course, the local market. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Hervé. Really inspiring work. And like I was saying before, it's, uh, this is where the rubber meets the road, folks. Uh, talking about the amount of money going here or there, or markets may be dry sounding, but it's, it's the ultimate like, end game of where this, uh, this project is going. So staying with the idea of, of rubber, uh, is there any 
distillates or, or resins or anything like that that Moringa Fund is, is getting into developing? Because I know uh, it sounds like your, your products so far are mostly about food and medicine, but like as uh, I know different resins or like Damar or, or rubber, things like that, fibers, are those on your radar as well? Well, today we concentrate, uh, microphone. We, we concentrate mainly on, on, on the food, but cosmetic also can, could also be, uh, be deployed. I was uh, talking about, we are working in region where you have shea butter, for example, and shea butter mm -hmm. can be used for, uh, for cosmetics. The Moringa, we also produce co Moringa. Moringa can uh, be processed into herbal teas and also uh, cosmetics. Can you give us a sense for, um, you, you, you threw out a few numbers about investment numbers. Can you give us a sense for, uh, very generally, what Moringa Fund has invested literally into agroforestry at this point to get to this inspiring place it is? Uh, how, the amount of money? 50 million, 50 million euros. One, one five? 15? No, 50, 50, five, five zero. zero. Okay. Five zero. Five. So we have, uh, we have developed uh, 10 different project, we have invested in mm. 10 companies, so that represents something like uh, 5 million per project mm. as a, uh, gotcha. an average. An average. And, and uh, also I wanted to know if, um, I know your, your team is pretty busy, but if an investor came up and said, I want to put 10 million euros in, where and how would you expand? Would you go to a new region or would you try to, you know, Scale up scale your up. vertical situation. With I think it's precisely what we like. To, we would like to do in the in the next Moringa. It's to expand, to give, to scale up what we did, because we think that uh, to have more impact on the region in which we have invested, okay. and probably improve the market access to all these uh, our growers. All right. Very good. Your your question is over. <laughs> Thank you, Hervé. Now I would love to hear from Tony Simons, who obviously needs no introduction, but he should feel free to say whatever he likes about himself as head of World Agroforestry. Great, thanks Eric, and please don't start the time yet because the organizers have given me permission to do a quiz. Because we're on day one of, a, of the Congress and the energy levels are a bit low, so we've got to boost them up again if we're gonna survive. So can everyone please stand up? Please get, stand up in your chairs, where you are. It's not going to be aerobics or anything. So there's a lot of elections going on around the world at the moment. DR Congo, India, Australia, uh, Brazil just recently. Um, yeah, you can stand up as well. <laughs> Great, can everyone stand up? Right, so there's many ways in these elections you can vote. You can vote with your card, you can vote with your head, you can vote with your heart, you can vote with your thumbprint. We've invented a new way of voting, and you vote with your backside, yeah? So when you agree with something that I say, you sit down, okay? That's how you vote. And you only got one vote, you've only got one backside, one vote. So when you sit down, that is how you voted. So, please sit down if you would describe yourself as a capitalist. <laughs> okay, let me soften it a bit for you. Please sit down if you would describe yourself as somebody who's trying to maximize returns to capital. Ooh. <laughs> okay, please sit down if you would describe yourself as somebody who likes to maximize and optimize returns to social capital, environmental capital, and financial capital. <laughs> so you're all Pretty capitalists. Good <laughs> <laughs> very, okay, good. very good. Taking off the time. Okay. And we started that just to explore your biases and thinking. Public goods and private interests. What an intriguing title. But immediately you can think, hmm, private interests, if we've got public goods, those private interests must be public bads. Because we're fixated on the risks of engaging with the private sector. The reputational risks, the risks to the smallholders, the, the uh, risks to uh, our
connections with other people, our suspicions of what those private sector people are up to. But there's also benefits of engaging with the private sector. And these are around information, understanding markets. These benefits are based on sharing resources and co-locating your work. And these benefits are based on being able to take your work to a much greater scale. And we all know about public-private partnerships, of how we link those two sources of funding together. But the public, the, the overseas development assistance, at least for the work that's going on in the tropics, is funded by um, OECD donors. And for every dollar of ODA, there's $3 of remittances, there's $6 of foreign direct investment. There's $24 of domestic private sector spend, $35 of developing country spend, and $1,000 of private capital to be mobilized. So why are we only fixated on working with that dollar? We've got to connect those sources in a much better way. And the private sector is a very diverse group. It's not just the multinationals, it's the individual producers and the SMEs that support them. And the private investors are another group. These private investors are the ones who have, have you know, credit, equity, grant and guarantees that can be leveraged as well. So, Yeah, your mic on the left. You oh. need to move the mic up. Okay, sorry. Yeah, there you go. Great. So we've got, a, we've got some flawed logic here because we, we, we trapped ourselves saying, well, we generate public goods using public funding, and public goods are, are mainly kind of outputs, the knowledge, the germplasm, the analysis, the science that the researchers engage in, when actually we want to disrupt that logic and say, well, we believe that we can better link public goods to private interests. And where public goods are not just the outputs, but also outcomes and impacts. And we want to use private interest to generate public goods as well, enlighten self-interest of those companies and investors, where the public and private goods and interests blend in a business case. So this is the funding in Europe, country by country, uh, from 2016. The, the purple amount there is the private sector, the orange comes from the government, uh, the green is from international NGOs, and the red is from education institutes. That's what it looks like for Europe. Now, does that look identical to Africa? Bit of a difference. So we've got to be very careful when we look at the private research funding model of Europe and try and apply it in Africa. So do we try and support the government more, work more with the private sector, or engage in all of those approaches? So with innovative finance, and our, our research development policy delivery institute, the World Agroforestry, we are you know, very much convinced by these two approaches, the blended finance approach, of the United Nations and OECD, and the maximizing finance development approach of the World Bank. But look at that latest report from OECD where it highlights the paucity of blended finance around SDG 15, around land use, around agroforestry, around the type of things that we all uh, care so much about, almost invisible. And so it is the connecting that credit, grant, equity, and guarantee in clever ways through the actors to de-risk smallholders. If any investor is telling you that they're chasing double digits and they're working with smallholders, be very cautious because the risk will end up on the smallholders. Put the risk on the investors and the off-takers and drive it with performance logic that everyone has to perform and your investors and your private sector partners will be happy because of that quality, that assurance, that supply chain integrity and competitiveness. So how do we make that happen? Well, two years ago, we launched with United Nations Environment, ADM Capital, BNP Paribas, a $1 billion landscape fund in Indonesia. It's supported by the government, but the government doesn't control it. 
And this uh, tropical landscape finance facility, its first deal was a $95 million deal, $95 million, with the second largest guarantee that the US government has ever given underwriting it. It's based on three bond issuances, 10, 12, and 15 years, chasing a modest return. And it's, a, it's an integrated project where it's combining uh, around the Bukit Tigapula National Park, this 400,000 hectare landscape with rubber producers, plantation rubber, smallholder rubber, concession areas, uh, national park, and local communities so that everyone has got to drive on performance to be able to generate that financial flow to satisfy uh, the conditions in the term sheet for that loan. You may, many of you in the audience, have heard about the recent merger of C4 and ICRA. These are two institutions working at landscape level with investments around generating interest with the private sector. And a lot of that success has come through the Forest Trees and Agroforestry uh, program. This is one of the uh, research programs of the CGR, which is, has its main office based here in, in Montpellier at CIRAD. And this is a fantastic example of where we can all connect together better with the private sector and remove some of that bias that demonstrated we didn't want to sit down because we didn't want to be identified as a capitalist. But I'm a social capitalist, and I'm a natural capitalist, and I'm a human capitalist, and yes, also, I'm interested in financial capital. And so lastly, um, Chair, um, the Global Landscape Forum. This is a platform that cuts across all, a wide range of uh, stakeholder groups, the World Bank, the United Nations Environment, uh, WRI, um, huge numbers of institutions supporting landscape level efforts. And that's what agroforestry is. It's not about lines of trees or blocks of trees. It's about rural transformation. It's about social cohesion. It's about thinking of those urban rural linkages that we're going to need in future, about that more uh, deliberate land use and land management as we face these problems of climate change, loss of biodiversity, etc. So in terms of investment in private sector, do plan to come to Luxembourg on the 30th of November to hear about the business case for landscapes. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you, Thank you Tony. Fantastic. So you've been doing some real bridge building with capitalists, which is really impressive. Some of these examples you gave, like the $95 million investment, uh, you are getting to be known uh, in these circles. Agroforestry is getting to be known in these, in these circles. How, I imagine that's a bit of a change. How much of a change is it, and how big of a gap do we have to get to a place where more investors know what agroforestry is and can make a difference so they can help scale this? Where do where you think that, that break point is, and, and maybe how do we get there? Well, as much as scientists have some biases and misconceptions about the private sector, the private sector also have some biases and mixed conceptions about public institutions and scientists and, and NGOs and, and academics and, and other delivery partners. And it's, it's only by coming together. And when you're invited into the conversation, either way, you can learn a tremendous amount. And it doesn't have to be a financial flow. The worst thing with the private sector is if you think that you're going to get uh, a research contract as, as, a, as, a, as a contractor. It's, you want a relationship with the private sector, and the private sector want a relationship with you. Take money off the table. But if you can get into the co-design, the co-location, the co-investment towards aligned activities, that's when you start to see the synergies and much more exciting things happening. And it's about sharing that knowledge, letting each other shine the torch under the bed, let, you know, finding the dirty sock behind the wardrobe, you know, exposing yourselves to the logic and approaches of those. And if, if you're a scientist and want to engage with the private sector, keep your independence, keep your autonomy, okay? Keep your inquisitiveness, but ask those challenging questions in a friendly way, not in a confrontational way. Shining a light.
Yeah, I agree. Thank you. All right, we want to turn to our next speaker and hear what she is doing. It's Rachel Colby Samoon, and she's with the Invivo Fund, and they're doing some really interesting things, and they're capitalists. And if I can just jump in here, what we might do in the interests of time is take the rest of our speakers one after the other, and then we'll go straight out because I'm sure a lot of you would have questions as well. And if you can all stick to the time, that would be really fantastic. Sure. So, yeah, um, I am. I'm Sustainable uh, Development Director at Invivo, which is a union of uh, French agricultural cooperatives. So we have the cooperative model. Um, so are we capitalists? I don't know. What we are, we are triple capitalists. And I'm going to talk about that, and, but I've already had an extreme, extremely great uh, uh, introduction to what that is. Um, but yeah, we have about 200 uh, French agricultural cooperatives in our union. Um, and what we try to do is mutualize uh, understanding, research, and development in order to provide solutions that help them always improve what their uh, own livelihoods are. And within that uh, vast uh, ambition, uh, one of the things that we decided to do was to create InVivo Foundation, which is an endowment fund, and that is really focused on seeing how we can improve farmers' livelihoods. Obviously, we want to improve French farmers' livelihoods um, specifically, but we're also working to see how we can improve farmers across the world, their livelihoods, their capacity of um, bridging new uh, solutions that are in food, but sustainable food and sustainable food systems, and also is how we can not conserve, but actually take care of uh, natural resources. Um, and that's what we've been doing for about uh, two years, so we're quite young as an endowment fund. Um, but what I've come upon in working in sort of some of these types of discussions, be it agroecology, um, living agriculture, agriculture du vivant, as we say in France, um, regenerative agriculture, agroforestry, what I've discovered is that far too often we tend to have a very negative viewpoint of agriculture as a whole. We see agriculture for its negative uh, part as a great polluter um, that is in crisis, that no longer is able to make ends meet. We talk about suicides, we talk about pollution, um, we talk about um, uh, food health scares, um, and we see that we're really up to the end of a model, and some writers think that that is somewhat because of capitalism. But what I want to say, is what, and what I'm working on absolutely every single day, is to see how we can actually have a, a paradigm change so that it's actually positive agriculture. Because when we start looking at all of the different challenges that we've heard about from, from the beginning of the morning, but anyway, in every single newspaper every day for now a couple of years, is that almost all of the world challenges that we're up against, it's agriculture that's going to help resolve the problem. It's going to help in terms of employment in the rural sector. It's going to help in terms of food security. It's going to help in terms of food safety. It's going to help in terms of mitigating climate change. And so that's, what I, that's when I discovered agroforestry, um, because that's, I realized that not only can agriculture do all of those things, but it can actually help provide biodiversity and improve biodiversity. It can help um, make water safer for a whole lot of countries where actually they are no longer having access to safe water. Um, and so t discovering that agroforestry, but also agroecology, uh, is what's going to change this, the deal. And so I wanted to give an example, a concrete example of a project that we're working on in Nigeria, just north of Lagos. Nigeria being always one or a second uh, of the top uh, um, African economies, but mainly petrol uh, oil based economy um, that had been agrarian before they discovered black oil. Um, I mean black gold, excuse me, um, and where there's a whole lot of know-how but that hasn't necessarily been used to help change the paradigm that I've been just talking about. Um, and so we came, when uh, there were the Paris Accords in 2015, Nigeria signed on to the land degradation neutrality scheme saying that each country has to play a, a role in seeing how they can actually provide to, um, solutions in order to mitigate or even improve um, the quality of lands. 
Um, and so we found uh, a little over 100,000 acres just north of Lagos that were two forest regions that have been deforested up to about 95% each. And both of them were deforested mainly due to agriculture that was mismanaged um, and illegal logging um, and burning uh, down trees to, to make coal to sell in, in Lagos. And what we're doing is we're actually going to, we've just been working for about um, three years. I, I've come onto the project since uh, Invivo Foundation uh, was launched, um, where we've actually gone there locally, worked with all of the, so the local people who are on those lands illegally, worked with the public sector in order to have permission to put those same people into a new scheme of working on sustainable agricultural methods um, within an agroforestry perspective um, in which they will be sure to be able to make um, safer foods for local consumption, both on the informal but also formal market for a greater return on what their practices will be, but also export using cash crops that we know grow very well there and that can actually interact in a more sustainable way. So this is something that we've put together working with almost every type of actor across the board. So we saw earlier, notably in Marenga's presentation, seeing the types of actors that are around that are, sorry, um, totally private, totally public, and everything in between. And actually everybody is involved so that it's a system where it is the famous uh, nine times win that we heard earlier. Mm. Um, and each is going to actually make do, but with the, within their own means. And so it's not going to be just bringing in subsidies as it so often has been done in the past in order to then give sort of a free pass to do something really good at first and then what happens when there are no longer the subsidies, it all crashes. But on the contrary, step by step involving each of the people within their own interests um, so that they actually can progress. And so we're going to, um, we have, both lots for the private sector, there are lots for the smallholder farmers for their own livelihoods, but then also they can contract to the private sector as well. Um, and we also then have some of the natural forest reserves that will be just the actual living capital for uh, these forest reserves themselves. Um, and also including corridors, so that there aren't, there's no longer the, the regular competition between herders um, and uh, sedentary farmers. And we're going to do that where we're actually going to compose with, let's say, um, heavy, uh, sorry, uh, rubber plants and cacao, or we can do with uh, uh, shea and carroty, but with manioc or with peanuts, so that we actually have that uh, extraordinary synergy between the different crops that are going to work for the different types of markets. But of course, when you start with agroforestry, it means you're planting trees, and that's going to take a certain amount of time. And we've been already working with these, these smallholder farmers, um, the 3,500 uh, families. And so how are we going to actually invite them into the scheme? Well, we have to make sure that they're actually going to be money, making money initially, too. So we're put, setting up um, greenhouses and accompanying them in the way that they can produce organic vegetables because we have done a market study to see that actually there's a 40% prime uh, bonus uh, in terms of the price that a whole lot of uh, operators are prepared to pay um, in Lagos and Abuja for starters. Um, and so we're, we're figuring out the scheme so that right away from the beginning when the trees are first planted, there's already a livelihood coming in. That means that the farmers, they themselves can actually take on the credits because we already know through traceability tools that they're actually going to be able to uh, sell for an, a, a nice profit uh, the vegetables that they'll be making, plus some also for their informal markets. Well, anyway, et cetera. I could go on and on with mm. the details, but as you see, we're taking a very holistic uh, agroecological approach, both on a human level, a sociological level, but also on an economical level, how all of it works out, who's, who's being able to pay in, get a return um, through just simple capital, but also actually carbon sequestration, so uh, environmental capital, um, water fi um, over 5,000 5, uh, cubic meters uh, per hectare in terms of water that has been filtered once that you have the living soils back in place. 
Um, so that's the kind of work that we're doing. And we're also, what, what's extraordinary about this project in Nigeria is that we're learning so much about agroforestry and we're seeing the, how, how pertinent it is in France as well, for example. We saw that this morning in the introduction, is that sometimes people think things are, are work for one area rather than another. But here we're really learning from each side constantly, this iteration. And so in France, for example, we're working on the living agriculture movement, uh, Pour un agriculture du vivant, where they too are going to work on agroforestry methods or agroecology, always working with the biodiversity of the soil, but then the interaction of different plants so that the farmer is actually going to be able to make a healthier product, but more economically because using less uh, inputs. The big thing that we're working on still is once that value is created by the farmer, how can we be sure that the money actually comes back into the farmer's pocket? That's something that's still out. We haven't found all the solutions. We're trying with digital traceability tools. We're trying with the blockchain. We're trying with a lot of very multilateral pro um, partnerships, plugging together all of the different uh, chains along the value chain. But that's still the future in the making. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have Jean-Manuel Jean Blouet from Nestle. And again, I hate to be pushing uh, the time here, but if, if you can maybe get through. I'm very happy and proud to be in front of this uh, audience. It's not so often that um, big corporations have the, the possibility to talk to uh, such uh, a large number of scientists and researchers. So if you allow me, I will switch to French. I prepare everything in English, but if I want to stick to the 10 minutes. So um, I'm Jean-Manuel Bluet from uh, Nestlé France, and je suis uh, directeur du développement durable. Et je représente aussi l'Alliance pour la préservation des forêts. Donc je, je vous parlerai un petit peu de comment cette alliance, dans un cadre de l'agroforesterie, peut nous aider à avancer sur ces sujets. Je, je vais aborder le problème de l'agroforesterie dans un premier temps via la, la problématique de la déforestation, hein, par laquelle j'ai commencé quand j'ai travaillé sur ces sujets. Et vous voyez que sur cette courbe, la déforestation reste un sujet majeur puisqu'on est au-dessus de 15 millions d'hectares qui sont déforestés chaque année, et c'est une tendance qui s'augmente. Et je pense qu'il y a un lien direct avec ce qu'on peut faire en termes d'agroforesterie. Et je vous parlerai aussi de ce que Rachel a parlé tout à l'heure, a mentionné tout à l'heure, le lien avec l'agriculture de conservation des sols. Sur le, la problématique des forêts, quand j'ai démarré il y a 10 ans, le, un des sujets... Les, le plus brûlant que j'ai eu à traiter tout de suite, ça a été la campagne de Greenpeace qui nous a attaqué sur le fait que nous n'avions pas de traçabilité sur une matière première essentielle qui était l'huile de palme. Et pour faire l'histoire courte, dix ans après, en fait, on a lié un partenariat, un partenariat avec Airbus et avec la fondation Earthworm qui nous permet aujourd'hui de vérifier par satellite 100% de nos fournitures d'huile de palme. Vous voyez que sur l'image satellite en haut à gauche, euh, je ne sais pas si on voit très bien, mais il y a des, des points rouges qui montrent les zones de déforestation et qui nous permettent de... Enfin, ça a deux bénéfices. Ça nous permet de retourner vers nos fournisseurs, hein, qui souvent sont des traders qui achètent de grosses quantités, et de vérifier euh, pourquoi euh, il y a de la déforestation alors que nous sommes engagés sur un, un engagement zéro déforestation. Et ça a un deuxième très gros avantage, c'est que ça nous oblige à faire de la traçabilité. Et si on veut être crédible quand on parle d'agroforesterie pour une entreprise de la taille de Nestlé, la traçabilité, c'est absolument essentiel. Donc cette problématique de déforestation, bien évidemment, on ne peut pas faire de développement seul. Et donc le, le, la deuxième chose que je voulais mentionner dans les actions que le, le groupe Nestlé essaye de faire, c'est de montrer, et on a démarré sur cette alliance en France, on espère pouvoir élargir à l'Europe très rapidement, c'est de montrer, et, et nous on est concerné sur un grand nombre des, des commodités qui sont à l'écran, que des approches segment par segment, filière par filière, en fait sont beaucoup trop lentes à transformer l'ensemble des filières, et qu'il nous faut aller maintenant très rapidement sur des approches territoriales que beaucoup d'entre vous connaissent. 
et qui ont en plus l'énorme avantage de pouvoir développer des, hein, des projets de développement sur le terrain, notamment des projets d'agroforesterie. De, et donc on milite énormément pour que cette approche territoriale, euh, on ne soit pas la seule hein, entreprise, on ne peut pas seul régler ces problèmes-là, même si on est une très grosse entreprise. On est conscient que euh, seul, en se regroupant, hein, et vous voyez en haut le, le, un graphique que certains d'entre nous vous connaissent peut-être, hein, qui a été mis au point avec Greenpeace notamment, sur la définition de ce que c'est que les forêts à haute valeur de carbone, ce qui nous permet effectivement de protéger des écosystèmes naturels dont on a cruellement besoin. Alors, bien sûr, tout ça, ce sont des vues d'ensemble, et donc je vais illustrer. Hein, euh, on est aussi engagé sur des projets terrain qui sont euh, directement liés avec la problématique qui nous intéresse aujourd'hui. Vous voyez ici quatre marques. Hein, donc c'est quelque chose qu'on a démarré, qu'on a communiqué il y a quatre ans, en 2014, Hein, des projets qui étaient à la fois des projets en France, sur des sources comme Vitel ou Perrier, où on a engagé avec les agriculteurs qui étaient sur ces territoires des projets agroforestiers agro avec l'ambition de travailler sur la protection des ressources en eau. Euh, Nescafé, Nespresso, c'était directement lié à la production de, de café. Et je crois que Tristan a prévu d'en parler peut-être un petit peu plus tard, donc je ne vais pas aller trop loin là-dessus. Ce qui, moi, m'intéresse, et vous le voyez sur ces photos, c'est que l'humain est au centre de ces projets. Ce sont des projets pilotes. Je ne peux pas vous dire que toute la fourniture de café ou de pommes de terre, de mousseline, de Nestlé sont aujourd'hui sur des projets agroforestiers, mais c'est des projets pilotes qu'on a initiés dans l'espoir de montrer qu'on était dans un cercle vertueux. Une des conditions, et vous le voyez sur la droite ici, c'est qu'on puisse communiquer aux consommateurs. Je pense que dans tout ce qu'on fait, en tout cas dans une entreprise telle que Nestlé, on essaye de faire en sorte que ça puisse être valorisé auprès des consommateurs, hein, que le travail, la plupart d'entre de, vous, vous êtes sur le terrain à développer un certain nombre de, de systèmes euh, avec les, les, les agriculteurs dans le monde entier. Nous, notre métier, c'est de faire en sorte que ce travail que l'on peut initier avec certains d'entre vous, on puisse le valoriser auprès des distributeurs et des consommateurs. Et aujourd'hui, parmi ces quatre projets, il y en a encore deux qui sont hein, sur les, les sources, donc Vitel et Perrier, qui sont tout à fait actifs. Euh, Nespresso, je pense, continue. Hein, on, ils, ils ont planté depuis quatre ou cinq ans, je crois, 500 000 arbres par an dans leur chaîne d'approvisionnement, ce qui leur permet en plus d'être carbone neutre hein, depuis maintenant plus de, plus de deux ans. Donc on reviendra là-dessus peut-être avec, euh, avec euh, Tristan. Je vais me concentrer sur un projet qui me tient à cœur, qui est le projet qu'on a monté avec Mousseline. Donc c'est une marque, pour les gens qui ne vivent pas en France, c'est une marque qui fait de la pomme de terre déshydratée, qui a plus de 50 ans d'existence en France, qui est très très populaire. Et donc en 2013, on a décidé, en travaillant avec un certain nombre d'acteurs sur le terrain, d'initier des projets d'agroforesterie. Et là, vous voyez en 2013, donc une discussion qui avait lieu avec un des fermiers avec lequel on était en contrat, et qui lui se plaignait d'un gros problème d'érosion. Hein. Vous voyez les pieds, euh, hein, il a les pieds dans, le, dans la glaise, il a les pieds dans la terre, parce que son terrain, juste après un, un, un événement euh, plus vieux important, était parti, euh, enfin, il avait quitté sa, sa parcelle. Et donc il était d'accord pour qu'on engage ensemble un projet agroforestier. Vous voyez en 2019 hein, que ce projet, enfin, le, le, les arbres ont fait le, leur job. Et en fait, le, le, une des conclusions auxquelles je suis arrivé, et c'était le deuxième point que je voulais, je voulais mentionner ici, c'est qu'en fait ce projet était trop petit, qu'il était sous forme de pilote, et qu'on a eu énormément de mal d'entraîner. On travaille avec à peu près 180 producteurs locaux autour de l'usine, c'est une usine qui est en Picardie, et on a eu énormément de mal à entraîner l'ensemble des agriculteurs autour de ces projets-là, même si sur cet exemple-là, on était arrivé à un, à un succès. Et donc, ce qui nous a conduit à initier un projet, et là aussi, vous voyez que l'échelle est une échelle territoriale, hein, donc c'est en, en lien avec ce que je, ce que je disais tout à l'heure sur le, 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 la nécessité de ne pas travailler uniquement en filière, mais de travailler sur des territoires. Hein, et vous voyez ici en haut à droite que ce projet n'est pas un projet qui est uniquement financé par Nestlé, mais c'est un projet qui regroupe 
à la fois des industriels, des distributeurs, euh, qui est en droite ligne avec un projet qui est un projet de territoire hein, sur les hauts de les hauts de France. Et pour moi, c'est une des conditions du succès euh, de l'implémentation de projets agroforestiers en France, c'est de pouvoir travailler avec plusieurs acteurs. L'autre condition, et vous voyez le, le, la cartouche qui est au centre, hein, qui est le, le the Living Soil Initiative, c'est quelque chose qu'on a démarré, qui est très proche. Hein, de, de ce que Rachel a mentionné, hein, le, le mouvement pour une agriculture du vivant, on a le, le même genre d'approche qui est vraiment de travailler avec des agriculteurs qui ont déjà pratiqué hein, des techniques euh, d'agroécologie, hein, moindre labour, avec un, un, un couvert permanent des sols, avec euh, un travail qui est fait sur des rotations qui sont le plus longues possible. Et en fait, on s'aperçoit que ce sont des conditions absolument indispensables pour qu'on puisse ensuite parler de l'intérêt de l'arbre qui vient dans la continuité, si vous voulez, de ce qu'on on peut proposer aux agriculteurs qui sont sur des modèles extrêmement intensifs aujourd'hui. Et donc il faut leur montrer que l'arbre vient en complément hein, de ce qui est fait au niveau de la fertilité des sols. Planter des arbres dans des sols qui sont en train de mourir, on ne pense pas que ce soit la solution qui soit la, la meilleure. Et puis la dernière cartouche en bas, c'est une, une publicité qui a été diffusée par la marque Mousseline, hein, et qui recrée, vous voyez, cette, cette petite fille est en train de goûter sa purée et d'avoir dans la main une pomme de terre. On pense qu'il y a un lien extrêmement important à faire avec les consommateurs pour recréer du lien avec l'origine des matières premières et la façon dont les matières premières sont cultivées. Hein, donc le, le, le point de travailler au niveau d'un territoire me paraît essentiel, le point de lier euh, l'agroforesterie avec l'ensemble euh, des techniques qui sont utilisées me paraît aussi essentiel. Finalement, euh, si je, je résume en termes de, de financement, puisque c'est là-dessus qu'on a, on, on a, on a été questionné, euh, le, le, le point clé, c'est d'arriver à le lier à l'ensemble de la chaîne. Hein, je, tout à l'heure, je l'ai mentionné, à la fois les producteurs, bien, bien évidemment impliquer tout le monde agricole dans la définition des projets et les pilotes qui sont euh, désignés, et être capable d'entraîner l'ensemble de la chaîne jusqu'au consommateur. Vous voyez ici plusieurs images hein, qui montrent ben, là, les, les différents secteurs dans lesquels on intervient. Hein, à la fois en France, en Europe, et puis ben, en Asie ou en Afrique. Et je pense que le, le, le point commun, c'est un, un, le, le, le fait qu'on a toujours ce, cette importance de travailler avec les communautés locales, de travailler euh, ensemble. Ce n'est pas un industriel ou ce n'est pas un secteur seul qui va pouvoir y arriver. Il faut vraiment travailler en, en alliance hein, et, en, et en regroupement. Voilà, ben, je vous remercie. J'ai à peu près fini mon, mon temps de parole. Et je serai ravi de répondre à des questions s'il y en a un peu plus tard. Merci beaucoup. Next, we'll hear from Tristan Leconte. I had the pleasure of signing a writer to go visit one of his projects that Pur Projet is uh, funding out in Morocco. It's a women's um, olive oil yeah. uh, cooperative, and it's fantastic. And in you. fact, one of the women, it, the, the project's been so well uh, realized that some of the, um, some of the uh, women have taken on leadership roles, and one has even entered the parliament. So it's fantastic in a country like... Yeah. So congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations to them. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here again. Um, so how to mobilize the, the, the private sector for agroforestry? Uh, we see that there is a, a, um, a miscomprehension about forests and trees. They are often seen as obstacle to human development and obstacle to agriculture. Uh, I was in, in China one year ago, and uh, it was a perfect ecosystem for coffee, but the, the company wanted to install coffee tr trees, so they started to cut all the forest and remove all the soil and then plant their coffee. And then they were like, oh, how are we going to produce our coffee now? We need water and we need fertilizer. It's a, it's a perfect example of the total nonsense in which we're living. And we've totally uh, forgotten that actually trees are the best uh, uh, friend, I would say, of agriculture and human development because, as Francis Allais says, trees don't keep anything for themselves. They recycle everything and they are the exact opposite of humans, which uh, just produce waste and keep everything for themselves. 
So we definitely need trees uh, to balance our um, equilibrium with nature. And I think this is a mission of all of us to make people understand that trees are our future and our best partner both for economic development and, and to stay a good triple capitalists. Um, uh, trees are magic indeed. Uh, we've listed more than a hundred benefits of planting trees, economic, social and environmental, but as well cultural and spiritual and I'll get back to this later on. So to me, trees are magic, and it is really the message that we have to convey. We have gold in our hands, especially with all the scientific studies that you do, and that unfortunately are not uh, known enough, and there is a, a big need to make these scientific studies more known. Let me share with you four slides that help us as Pure Projet to sell trees, I would say, to the private sector, not selling the trees themselves, but the, the planting of the trees, because this is our role. With Pure Projet, we develop in setting via agroforestry projects. So first, uh, this tree, uh, Pino Chuncho, planted in Peru, is five years old. It costs only four dollars to plant it and monitor it on 40 years. Who would not buy or invest in a tree? Who would not invest four dollars to plant such a tree? Uh, Okay, everybody's convinced. This is a good way, I think, to, to, to convince people that trees, it's totally amazing. You plant them once and then you, you see them grow forever. Uh, uh, that's why we, 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 we often say that trees are the best investment one can make on the planet. And again, it is, it is not so much known. When you, when you think that instead of buying an iPhone, you could plant 200 trees like this one, or maybe 150 like this one, it's crazy, and where do we make our choices? And I totally subscribe as well to Eric's point of view. I'm a bit appalled when I see in the, in the, in the newspaper that we invest billions or millions or billions for a new technology to sequester carbon, whereas we have trees for millions of years, and how we're so proud of our intellect. Uh, I think we are, we are very, uh, a very, very stupid animal. <laughs> Um, so the concept that we, we promote, uh, that we've helped to, to, to develop with Pure Project is the concept of insetting because if you plant the trees within your supply chain for a company, so now we're talking to the, to the private sector, if you plant these trees within their supply chain, you create much more value, you help them to secure their procurement, to recreate value, most of the companies now have forgotten where they buy the products from, they don't even care about that because it's just, they define themselves as a marketing company, they thought that upstream it doesn't have any value, and now they realize that yes, it has value to, uh, to think again about the supply chain and to invest in them. So to me, the concept of insetting to plant the trees, not only to plant trees for the beauty of it, but as well to plant trees for companies within their supply chain because it can generate multiple benefits on soil, water, biodiversity, uh, social, cultural, spiritual, etc., is very strong and it helps the company, for example, to secure its procurement and the quality of its product. It's the case for Nespresso, for example. First, we planted for Nespresso to inset their carbon footprint, but we've seen, for example, in Colombia that uh, the coffee rust was destroying almost 40% of the production three years ago, and Nespresso was buying about 40% of its coffee from Colombia. So now Nespresso plants the trees in Colombia as well to secure the procurement. And you have to be aware as a company that if you want the best quality product, like gourmet coffee, or high quality products, ingredients for the luxury sector. We work a lot, for example, for brands like Clarins or Chanel, etc. You can't get the best product in the world from a degraded ecosystem. And the best way to regenerate this ecosystem is to develop agroforestry. So it's not only a question about climate, but as well, it's a question about securing your procurement and getting benefits. And this is how we prove to companies the magic of trees and all, uh, I mean, this, uh, this uh, tool that we call the monetizer helps us uh, to value what is the potential value creation when you plant a tree, so it costs $4, and how much can it generate. It's based on a scientific review. We've listed about 1,200 sci um, um, scientific papers that, that you have done. Um, uh, and it serves as proxies when we prepare a project or when we, we make a simulation on a project to see what is the potential benefit for the company. 
it's not a tool that we pretend is scientific, uh, but it's to help companies to make the decision. Because which investment do you know on Earth that has a return on investment on, of 68%? It's just unbeatable. So here we can prove that indeed trees is the best investment one can make for the planet. And you see that if you do, is, uh, if you do it as offsetting, the company gets only 30 cents. Huh? The, the carbon credit itself represents 30 cents per tree per year of value creation. But when the company plants the tree within its supply chain as insetting, it multiplies the benefit of the tree by 10 because it gets as well the, secu the securing of the procurement, the, the, the improvement of the quality, and as well the brand equity valuation because the company is engaged, etc. So that's how we can prove that planting trees is a great tool and even more if you do it within your supply chain as in setting because you get much more benefits. Going further than that, um, we see as well that uh, trees bring a lot of immaterial benefits and it is very important because the future for consumers to choose their product will be purpose. If you listen to the millennials, they don't want to work in a company that has no meaning and no purpose. They don't want to buy a product that has no meaning. Their dream is not to have the car and the dog and the fence and the house. No, they want to have experience and they want to link themselves with things that have a real value and a real purpose. And I've never met in my life someone who was not attached to the symbol of trees. Who doesn't like trees here? <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so why, uh, why is tree and agroforestry maybe even more the best investment one can make? Because trees relate to where we're coming from. We all come from the trees. We were hang hanging in the trees before. Maybe we should climb up the tree again to, to go back to reason. Maybe we've lost our reason. And as well, the forest uh, is the origin of many medicines and the origin of spirituality, forests were sacred, and why were they sacred? To protect them. Maybe now with monotheist religion, we've forgotten that God has created us and we can control and dominate nature as we want. Maybe we have to go back to this spirituality, animist spirituality. Maybe we have to rehabilitate the spirit of the forest and the the value of the shaman, of the natural healers, maybe we shall organize a, a big ayahuasca gathering together to link ourselves <laughs> with nature. And I'm, some may think it's for fun that I'm saying that, but we are totally disconnected with nature in our society. And what we need is a cultural change or a spiritual change to link again ourselves with nature, to feel that we are one with nature, because if we destroy nature, we destroy ourselves. And maybe this is the way we can mobilize the private sector by revaluing this spirituality of forest and of nature. Thank you very much. So, Eric, just maybe a final few words, because sadly we're pushed for time. We don't have time for questions, but maybe a final few words from you. Well, no pressure, but uh, very, very good session, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, I've learned a lot, and um, I, as with most things, you know, like if you're a scientist or a teacher, uh, you try go out to answer a single question, and you get three or four more. Uh, same thing here. Uh, these folks are a real resource, and I'm really glad that we were able to share this time with you, and um, and really hear where the sector is going because it's very exciting. Uh, you know, but between what we heard about cooperatives and about marketing and thinking about whole um, supply chains being, you know, vertically integrated, there are a lot of really good ideas. And I think, you know, for me as a journalist, it's it's uh, it's something fantastic because these are ideas that um, that I'm charged with getting out there too. But uh, everyone here in the, in the audience, um, it's your job as well to understand. Uh, the role of, of how you know these partners in the private sector can be part of, of your work and, and to make the whole thing shine and, and get us to our missions that much more beautifully. So thank you everyone for coming and thank you. Okay, and, um, and thank you so much. Uh, maybe ladies and gentlemen, a really good warm round of applause for our panelists. 
I mean, I have to say, Tristan, if any of us were in danger of falling asleep, you woke us up. I mean, so you, I, you, I think, will provide us with some of the take-home sentences and words and sound bites of the conference. The magic of trees, we've gold in our hands. Who doesn't like trees? You plant them once and they grow forever. And I love your idea of the shaman and, you know, and bring the spirituality back of the forest. So well done for such an inspiring end of day words and you know to motivate people is really good thank you so much panelists you're free to go thank you so much for your time okay so we are nearly at the end of a very long but incredibly interesting day thank you so much for staying with us and now just before we end this day, we're going to hear a little bit more about the European Agroforestry Federation. And I'd like to invite our two speakers who are going to tell us a little bit more about that. They are Jao Palma and Francesca Camilli. So wherever you are, can you please come up to the stage? And just, um, Zhao has replaced Joe Smith, who was on the running order. Now, are you going to introduce the video? No. Oh, okay. I don't think so. <laughs> no. Okay, I love when surprises are sprung on me at the end of the day. Okay, so before then, um, so I think both of you are going to say a few words, but before then, we uh, have a video, which is a URAF video. So. Okay. Technicians, if you have that in the system, maybe we'll play that video. Here we go. One of the positive aspects of agroforestry is we're mixing perennial crops with annual crops. I believe that agrofloresta has a very important role in the agriculture of the future. Often people look at the system, what the agroforestry system we've got, and they think we're taking land out of production into trees. I would say it's the reverse. We're actually trying to make the farm more intensive. And we're doing that by trying to capture more carbon and actually use more of the soil below the surface and more of the space above the ground uh, and, and try and be more productive. As I uh, met pension ging, and so ben ik nu al 20 jaar boer. And, uh, Ik ben tamelijk vroeg begonnen met agroforestry en onder andere noten. Ik wist niet dat dat agroforestry was. Ik begon te doen agroforestry op een manier compleet inconscient. En zo me percebi dat we deden agroforestry toen ik werd bezocht door een aantal mensen die in de Europese Commissie werkten. En die waren heel verbaasd toen quando aqui chegaram uh, e me falaram em agrofloresta, porque eu, para mim é, é o sistema natural uh, aqui da nossa, da nossa região e, portanto, não houve uma ação deliberada de fazer uma agrofloresta ou de implantar uma agrofloresta, porque ela já existia e, e portanto, era o sistema que eu sempre, que eu sempre conheci. Waarom ik begonnen ben na agrofloresta? Ja, is om omwille van de voordelen uh, dat je een een extra product kan, kan telen, gemengd met, met je ja, akkerbouw er, hieronder. Uh, extra biodiversiteit, dat je gratis bladval hebt, dat er dus uh, organische stof bij komt. En vooral, wij zitten in een heel uh, binderige steek in de open polder aan, aan de kust. Um, en daarom wil ik zeker ook van de wind hier nog extra bomen aanplanten om die wind een beetje meer te breken. Dat je die bomen voordeel bij, maar ook, uh, ook gewoon de groenten. Uh. En de agroforesterie is een van de systemen die dat permet. Dat permet misschien uh, ook uh, te protegeren de sol, te uh, augmenter de uh, matière organique, te uh, maken een beetje d'ombrage, te reguleren l'eau, etc. En fait. En ik geloof heel erg aan deze systemen, en fait, tout simplement om te blijven produceren op deze côtes. Er was ook nog een reden voor de erosie, want het is altijd hetzelfde, het zijn côtes, dus het is heel erosief. En fait. Et chaque ligne d'arbre, si elle est plantée en travers de la pente, en suivant les courbes de niveau, ben forcément, elle crée une barrière. 
Et barrière mécanique, en fait, à, à, à l'eau et donc au sol. Et donc, Là aussi, ça a été un des, un des moteurs, c'est euh, l'érosion en fait, par rapport à l'implantation de, de ces bandes en RB avec des arbres dessus. Quoi. Senza tout dal punto di vista ambientale, parce que nous, non, par exemple, nous ne traitons, non ne consommons, et puis aussi des bénéfices économiques, en tant que le même terreno, trattandosi di azienda piccola, produit et de la pianta et de la zone. Donc, économiquement, c'est un peu Tudva lévő, hogy a ló és a bérkő nem ugyanazt eszi, tehát érdemes, ha nem is egy időben, tehát én ugyan egyszer a lóvakat engedem rá utána a birkákat, tehát a ló más főféle teszik, a birka megint más, és a kecske meg a bokrokat. Tehát én mindenkinek azt javasolnám, ha teheti kecske birka minimum, ha van módja, akkor ló is. És akkor nagyjából megvan a takarás, de, amit az előbb mondtam, hogy a gyom mellé kell a gép, mert kell a gép, azt kikerülő az állat, és ezzel együtt, tehát géppel, lóval, pirkával és kecskével talán megnyerjük a meccset. A recursos que emprego para o meu gado son baseados na natureza. Somos autosuficientes, o sea que non mercamos nada da fora. A alimentación do gado é de castiñeiros, por exemplo, aproveitamos os follatos, aproveitamos agora, desde que se acaba a colleita da castaña, as castañas, o líquen dos árboles, a folla, os follatos dos rebolos, e a parte deso, agora, nesta época, que normalmente está todo axeadado, pois sementamos centeo, pasten as ovellas, Dlaczego warto sadzić drzewa na pastwiskach? Mamy dodatkową produkcję drzewną, mamy dodatkową produkcję paszową, tak jak tutaj mamy ulęgałkę, która produkuje nawet do kilkuset kilogramów małych gruszeczek, które stanowią bardzo dobre uzupełnienie paszy dla bydła. One of the attractions for me for agroforestry is that you know, typically we only think of our crop production about a a metre above ground at, at most and probably half a metre below ground. Whereas the, uh, uh, the trees in the system are using more space. So we're, we're, uh, we're trying to capture sunlight for, for a longer period during the season and also using more space above and below the ground uh, to actually grow, grow, grow crops. So it's sort of vertical or tiered farming systems. Days like today are great. These workshops where we bring people together uh, everyone has a space to talk about their ideas and what they're doing and you know we they learn from us and we learn from them and uh, it's just such a beautiful thing and I'm really happy that after that supports this kind of thing. It's, it's really incredible to bring everyone together and just talk about what's what's going on. What are the ways of work? What are the things that are how can we help each other? I think there's a lot of work to do and there's a lot of research and kind of experimenting but I just see that every Every aspect of it seems to be positive in some way. I can't really find any faults with it. It's better for the animals, it's better for the soil, it's better for the woodland, it's better for me. You know? It's uh, that kind of thing. Very good. So, oh, we're still of. Okay, so an example of the benefits of agroforestry there, that video produced by URAF, the European Agroforestry Federation. So very briefly, to end this part of the segment, we now have João Palma from Portugal and Francesca Camilli, who are going to talk about URAF and also the Congress, your Congress in 2020. So. <laughs> Nearly there, Linda there. Um, 
All right, just a few words to save you time to enjoy our European agroforestry tour uh, on the three levels, so you have plenty of space to enjoy the, 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 the countries. I'm just here to introduce IRAF for those who don't know um, about IRAF. IRAF was created in 2011, uh, so we have uh, eight years of, of age. Um, and our aim is to promote the use of trees in farms throughout Europe um, in different regions of Europe. And we do that for, in four main, four main things. Lobbying for agroforestry, adapted at European scale. Then we need our mission together as European uh, delegates is to try to re-engage our country level um, to engage in this European um, scale. Um, organizing a biannual conference, which we have here, Camilla, um, Francesca, um, to, to speak about it in more detail, and I seriously invite you to go to the Italian um, uh, stand because you won't regret it. <laughs> and of course, we have a newsletter to, to, to engage your, 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 your knowledge in uh, what we do and what's going on at European, at European scale, well, at European level. And of course, we have uh, a website for, to share information scientific results and policy issues on agroforestry so, so you keep to keep up to date sometimes it's very um, information flow is, is uh, it's, uh, has a rhythm of uh, sometimes it's in different places so we try to gather in in, in era uh, web page so once won't um, waste more your, of your time so please enjoy uh, European tour level zero one and two and please welcome give the floor to Francesca to speak about in next year, in May. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you, just a few words. And I would like to announce on behalf of Europe and uh, the Italian national and the local organizing committee, the fifth European agroforestry conference that will be held in Nuoro in uh, Sardinia next year in uh, May 2020. So you're all warmly invited to attend this conference. It will be a conference on agroforestry for the transition towards sustainability and bioeconomy. And as Joao said right now, they, we have a stand in the Congress Hall. And please, we are invited to have a, a real taste of Sardinia. So please, you're invited to join our stand. Thank you. Thank you very much.